4,976 people were killed in the first three months of 2021. This is 387 more people killed compared to the corresponding period. Welcome to Unsolved Murders SA, a podcast series where we will be delving into gruesome homicide investigations that, at the time of producing the episodes, were still open. The objective of this series is to keep the stories of the forgotten alive and hopefully help spark a memory for anyone listening in with intimate knowledge of the cases. The views, information or opinions expressed in this series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Swisher Post, its parent company and partners. Before we get into this episode, we'd like to thank you in advance for subscribing to our podcast. Every like, comment and subscription goes a long way in helping us grow our Unsolved Murders SA community. If you're a new listener, then please do us a favor and subscribe to our channel. Unsolved Murders SA is available on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. You can also find the latest updates on South African true crime stories at swisherpost.co.za. Assassinations, in a way, are the bedrock of transformation in politics. To enforce new ideologies and reframe the structure of norms, blood must be shed. This approach to power shifts in the highest orders of the political world can be traced back to 336 BC when Philip II of Macedon was struck down by a bodyguard at his daughter's marriage celebrations. He was the father of Alexander the Great, one of the world's most revered military strategists. Alexander the Great's ascension to power, his opportunity to transform political ideology at the time, hinged on his greatest sacrifice. Similarly, much later in 44 BC, the most famous Roman emperor, Julius Caesar, fell to the sword of his own senators, who felt it necessary to sacrifice the revered leader to preserve a political system that solely benefited the few. In South Africa, political assassinations have long been linked to the preservation of the status quo. The apartheid regime used this tactic to sow divisions in the struggle movement and collapse efforts to abolish the segregatory political system. Even in the advent of democracy, assassinations are very much prevalent. However, the motivation behind the mysterious deaths of Robert Schmidt and his wife, Jeanne Cora, are somewhat wedged between political links and uncharted chapters of their personal lives. Robert von Skalkweg Schmidt was born in 1933 and, in his adult life, rose to become one of the most prominent figures of politics during the apartheid era. In a book released by one of his children, side note, he and his wife Jeanne Cora had a son, Robert Jr., and a daughter, Lisa. The book is titled, I Am Lisa Smith, and in it, it stated that Smith was a privileged Rhodes Scholar who attended Pembroke College in Oxford and Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, and was revered for his thesis on, open quote, South Africa and international trade politics, close quote. If this spine-chilling story, which is easily one of South Africa's most mysterious unsolved murders, is of interest to you, then we highly recommend you read Lisa Smith's autobiography. In her book, Lisa, who was 13 years old at the time her parents were brutally murdered, names a number of suspects, some with strong links, and makes sensible points about the figures of the National Party she believes was central to the double homicide. The National Party was formed in Bloemfontein in 1914 by Afrikaner nationalists after the establishment of the Union of South Africa. The latter, of course, was the culmination of the Anglo-Boer War and ironically, the National Party was formed by former Justice Minister of the Union of South Africa, General James Barry Munich Herzog, following disagreements about the government of the time's push for a two-stream policy that advocated for the equal rights of English and Afrikaner communities. 
The National Party's first taste of power came after a coalition with the Labour Party in 1924, and Herzog, a proud Afrikaner, was elected Prime Minister. History does not indicate when Robert Smith joined the National Party. However, we can confirm that in 1967, more than a decade after he had met, fell in love, and married Jean Cora, the couple met in the UK during Robert's tenure as a scholar at Oxford. Mr. Smith served as the Deputy Secretary of Finance for the apartheid government. In 1971, at the age of 38, Robert Smith hauled his family to Washington, D.C. after securing a position as South Africa's ambassador at the International Monetary Fund. South Africa's relationship with the IMF has, over the years, been sketchy, to say the least. Former Minister of Finance Trevor Manuel has always been vocal about the international financial institution's lending history with South Africa and the role it played in providing credit to the apartheid establishment at a time when the rest of the world shunned its segregatory policies against non-white citizens. In the 1970s, South Africa received three credit payments from the IMF, mostly to assist with the balance of payment problems that emanated from the weakened gold price at the time. Robert Smith was an integral figure in negotiating the impossible during his tenure as South Africa's ambassador between 1971 and 1975. At the time, Global politics were not only highly frustrated with the apartheid government's enforcement of its racist policies, but debate was also rife about banks lending money to South Africa. A global stoppage to funneling money to the apartheid government would be enforced in the 1980s, but by then, thanks to Robert Smith, the National Party had found a loophole in the insurance trade. After vacating his position at the IMF in 1975, Robert Smith and his family returned to South Africa and aged 42 at the time, he was recruited as Managing Director of Santam, South Africa's largest short-term insurance company. The role of Santam in funding the apartheid government at a time when global financial institutions had followed suit in implementing sanctions against South Africa is key in the popularity Robert Smith garnered as a future leader of the segregated nation. Lisa Smith, in her book, however, notes that her father had always felt it was wrong that people of color were not afforded the right to participate in politics, let alone exercise their right to vote. Lisa was very careful with her wording. Not once did she articulate her thoughts on how her father felt about apartheid as a system of oppression. However unclear this was, it cannot be denied that Lisa, her brother, Jeanne Cora, Robert Smith, and their extended family were beneficiaries of the injustices of the system. Alas, by the mid-1970s, only a couple of years before the notorious murders, Robert Smith was in a prime position to challenge for presidency in the National Party. Writers at the time described him as a darling of the Afrikaner. Political corridors were abuzz with murmurs that Robert Smith would rise to become the Minister of Finance and usher the government into a new frontier, one that was independent of global support. In 1977, Robert Smith launched his political career into full swing and contested for candidacy as a leader of the Springs constituency months leading up to the national elections in November of that year. In what turned out to be a twist of fate, Robert and Jean Cora were forced to leave their children in the care of their family in Pretoria while the couple moved to Salcourt a quaint suburbia situated in Springs, Gauteng. Robert enjoyed a great deal of support from his wife. In her book, Lisa writes about the strength of Jeanne Cora, 
who was the anchor of the family. She took great care of her children and played a vital role in keeping her husband grounded in his pursuit of political power. What they did not know, however, was that this came at a price, one that they would pay for in the worst way possible. The fateful month of November 1977 came and Robert's campaigning was drawing to a close. By the 30th of November, he would be recognized as the winner of a hotly contested political campaign in Springs. As fate would have it, Robert Smith and his wife would die in the most brutal manner imaginable, eight days prior to realizing the outcomes of their hard work and sacrifice. On the 22nd of November 1977, a Tuesday, Robert was at his office in Springs, wrapping up the last bits and pieces of his political campaign. Jeanne was out running errands in the afternoon, chauffeured by the family's driver, Daniel Chabalal. Daniel would later inform investigators that Jeanne had returned from a busy day in the city at approximately 10 minutes past 6 p.m. And the last time he saw her alive was when he left the residence at 50 minutes past 6 p.m. Robert's office workers assisted investigators with building a timeline when they noted that somewhere between 14 minutes past 7 p.m. and 40 minutes past 7 p.m., they had received a phone call from Jeanne asking for her husband's whereabouts. Jeanne, according to the workers, wanted to inform her husband that the anti-national party voters he was due to meet with at his residence had arrived and were awaiting him. Jeanne's body was later found slumped over the phone, an indication that she had met her fate in the worst manner imaginable shortly after she had dropped the phone. According to an autopsy report released after the murders, it was confirmed that Jeanne had raised her left hand in defense before a gunshot was released on her head at point-blank range. The bullet had pierced her hand and entered her head. She was also shot in the back and stabbed 14 times with a weapon consistent with a stiletto knife. The forensic pathologist who examined Jian concluded she was the victim of overkill. The perpetrators behind the murder went to great lengths to ensure that there was not a single ounce of life left in the mother's body. Homicide investigators were never able to pin down exact times in the timeline, but it's believed Robert may have returned home between 30 minutes and 3 hours after his wife was brutally murdered. As soon as he entered the lobby of the rental, Robert was struck by a bullet in the neck. A second gunshot pierced his chest and a third entered the back of his head. The last two gunshots were fired at close range, pathologists found. Robert too was stabbed, but in his case, strangely enough, a single entry wound lodged by the same stiletto knife was found on his back. Ballistic examinations conducted after evidence was collected at the premises showed that at least two firearms were used in the commission of the crime. The crime scene was thoroughly combed for forensic evidence after the bodies were collected. However, investigators were never able to determine the areas where Jian and Robert were killed. Bloody shoe prints found at the residence were never matched, and despite a number of clues gathered, like the R-A-U-T-E-M spelling that was spray-painted on the kitchen wall and cabinets, no suspects were ever pursued in the double murder investigation. A lot of criticism was placed on the Springs Police Department on the manner in which the crime scene was handled. For one, first responding homicide investigators pitched up to the crime scene wearing casual clothes not covered by protective gear. Also, 
Springs police were criticized for failing to secure a parameter around the residence and no effort was made to prevent trampling over key areas of the crime scene. Moreover, the long hours that had gone by after the Smiths were killed had certainly not helped with the investigation. The couple's bodies were only discovered and subsequently reported on Wednesday morning. Daniel arrived on time to resume his duties, and as it was the norm, he knocked on his boss's door. But unusually, the call to response was not reciprocated that morning. Also, the door was bizarrely unlocked. So, in what was a rare occasion, he let himself in. Immediately, Daniel was met with the sight of Robert's corpse lying on the floor of the lobby, drenched in a pool of blood. Jeanne's body, he later revealed, was slumped over the house telephone in the lounge. Completely mortified by what he had discovered, Daniel ran to alert a neighbor about the gruesome discovery. Another crucial element of the investigation that has fueled conspiracies was Robert Smith's missing briefcase at the crime scene. Investigative journalist Chris Carsten, who authored the book Unsolved, No Answers to Heinous South African Crimes, hinted that this was the crucial piece of the jigsaw puzzle that would have sealed the investigation. Perhaps, Carsten wrote, the briefcase contained incriminating details of the sordid activities conducted by the Department of Information destined for Prime Minister John Vorster. A number of factors have been attributed as possible reasons to why the Smith's murder case remains unsolved. One reason is the amount of time that was afforded to the killers to conjure an escape unnoticed and completely disappear 10 or more hours before police were alerted. Another reason can be attributed to technological advances at the time. CCTV cameras were not popular in residential areas. Therefore, police had no visual references to rely on in gathering clues about the people involved in the murders. Perhaps, a crucial cog that may have lent a hand in heightening mystery around the murders were the R-A-U-T-E-M letters purposefully spray-painted across the residence kitchen walls. Whoever did it wanted investigators to dig into the meaning behind this clue. As it turns out, R-A-U-T-E-M was an Afrikaans term for a specialist subunit of the notorious intelligence agency, the Bureau of State Security, or BOSS, as they were infamously known. This was the most obvious lead birthed from the evidence collected at the crime scene and has, for decades, remained a focal point of the investigation. But, we have to ask, was this a fallacy to begin with? Perhaps, the killers used existing murmurs about Boss's reputation to spin a narrative about the National Party's relationship with Robert Smith? It sure is interesting that the killers, who had clearly made every effort to ensure their sordid plan was executed meticulously, would leave a revealing clue such as this for investigators to find. Anyhow, the presence of the spray paint sent shockwaves across South Africa, and many believed Boss's murderous commander, Hendrik van den Berg, a man who had gone at a reputation as the tall assassin, had masterminded the high-profile hit. Open quote. I have enough men to commit murder if I tell them to kill. I don't care who the prey is, close quote. Vandenberg once told a government commission. Those with intimate knowledge of the investigation would, however, discount the involvement of boss in the murders since, one, this was not the typical MO of a boss assassination, and two, 
The can of paint used to mark the letters belonged to the Smiths. Therefore, it was reasonably assumed that the killers had used this as an opportunity to sabotage the investigation. Quay Corte, a Ghanaian-American novelist, wrote extensively about the Smith murders as one part of a group of 11 investigative journalists who had formed a blog, Murder is Everywhere, an online true crime index that includes examinations of the most intriguing murder investigations. In his dissertation of the Smith murders, Quarte noted the crucial timing of the killings. Open quote. At that time in South Africa's political history, the atmosphere was fraught. During this period, the country was in utter turmoil. The inquest into the death of Steve Beagle had begun on November 14. A black high school student, Sipomalaza, had allegedly died in police custody. The 21st in some 20 months, and embargoes against South Africa were beginning to mount. Against this backdrop, it's easy to see how all kinds of people in various political camps could have ended up dead. The information scandal also broke out around that time, costing the jobs of the Prime Minister and a couple of his cabinet members. The scheme deflected funds from the defence budget to a number of pro-apartheid propaganda campaigns. Robert Smith might have had detailed detrimental information that he intended to expose after his putative election. A threat that would have been too dangerous for the implicated persons to let stand. Other conspiracy theories, too detailed to go into here, included Israel and nuclear secrets. Close quote. He wrote, The Smith murders were impaired by conspiracy theories, the most pronounced being that he held state secrets that, if revealed, would destabilize the apartheid regime. It is said that prior to his death, Robert Smith had uncovered a large-scale corruption ring within the governing party and had informed several people about the explosive information he planned to expose. Reports of this alleged corruption secret were first published by the Sunday Express in December 1977, and in the article, it was claimed that Robert Smith held privileged information on a foreign currency racket. The infamous information scandal that broke out in 1978, which named Prime Minister John Forster as the mastermind behind a multi-million rand slush fund that was used to steer a covert propaganda campaign, was also linked to the Smith's murder. It was believed at the time that Robert Smith was privy to this information and had planned to unveil it after the 1977 elections. Boss remained a central cog to the investigation as the years tumbled on. The state security organization was a key role player in the information scandal and according to reports, Robert Smith posed a great threat to its operations. The elusive Z Squad, a subdivision of Boss, was touted as the group responsible for killing the political couple. Former boss members Roy Allen, Dries Ferve, and Phil Freeman were named suspects in the report published by Bielt in the early 2000s. It was said that the trio pulled off the murders as a means of preventing Robert Smith from spilling the beans about deep-seated corruption that involved secret international bank accounts held by the state to pay shell companies. No charges were ever laid against the trio. Ferve died in 1980. Freeman took his own life in 1990. And Allen migrated to Australia and his circumstances were never revealed. In 2013, Allen published an article on Politics Web where he went into great detail about his version of events. What you are about to hear is Alan's full account of the Smith murders and who he believes was responsible. The news of the Smith murders in 1977 was a bolt out of the blue. Both I 
and my girlfriend were astounded as we searched for a motive. Ida had worked for Dr. Smith for about six to eight months in the preceding year when he was the chief of Santam International. They worked from a two-person office in the Johannesburg CBD. I had met him on one or two occasions while picking Ida up from his offices. He seemed like a very nice guy. Before this, Ida had worked as a secretary to P.W. Putter when he was Minister of Defense. She had a top-secret clearance from the military, which made her suitable for employment in such a confidential post with Dr. Smith. She was also later to work as the secretary of Fanny Butter, the then Minister of Labor, before going on to work for Professor Vihan when he was conducting the inquiry that became known as the Vihan Commission. She never discussed the nature of her work at any of these jobs with me and was fanatically loyal towards her government bosses. Try as I might, I could not bring anything into the context of the political setup that existed within the RSA at the time to work out what the words R-A-U-T-E-M meant. I could only infer that these cryptic letters had meaning for some person or persons involved with the Smiths, as this was clearly a message or warning of sorts. After a while, however, the whole thing passed and receded into history. At the time, I had wondered, could it have been Colonel Dries Vervey, my commander at the police special task force? I was thus not totally surprised when his driver asked me in the ensuing days if I had been involved with Vervey in the murders. This seemed to bear out what I had been thinking. His driver knew Fervey very well. He was also aware that I had conducted extrajudicial operations with him in Cape Town. My suspicions that Fervey could have been involved are not founded on any clues at all. For instance, there were no Smith briefcases in Fervey's office safe, as has been alleged. Rather, just a well-developed gut feeling or sixth sense. You ask then, why did I think this way? A valid question. It was because I had been witness to the cold menace of Fervey's anger and privy to some of the goods and devices that accompany him from his D4 section at Security Branch HQ. In his special room at SB HQ, he had silenced weapons of many different types and calibers, poisoned bottles of exotic Portuguese liquor that were popular in Mozambique and Angola at the time, Zambian police officer uniforms and sulkies, and transistor radios that were loaded with deadly explosives that would blow up anyone switching them on. There were also parcel bombs made in seized copies of Mao Tse Tung's Little Red Book. These bombs were made with surgical precision, with the pentalite poured into the hollowed out inside in molten form. The way the pages were surgically cut and glued, the placement and affixing of the micro switch and the arming device was like looking at the innards of a Swiss timepiece. This was the typical handiwork of Phil Freeman, who was a perfectionist. And when Ferve and Freeman had both been at boss, they had worked very closely together, as well as in the security police, long before the inception of BOSS. To give an example of Freeman's attention to detail, back in 1972 I still smoked. After lighting a cigarette, I would let the match burn three quarters and then grip the burned end and let the rest burn out. Phil said that this was a unique characteristic that would link me to any location where I had smoked a cigarette and that I should desist from such identifiable habits. At the time, I was doing jobs with another boss member, and whenever we went, my tag that I spray-painted and read at the scene was a Russian hammer and sickle. Being left-handed, I did it the wrong way around, i.e. a mirror image of the correct way. Phil cautioned me about this idiosyncrasy, as it could lead directly back to me. He was a very, very focused and astute man 
who had he remained in the British military after World War II would have surely ended up as chief of special operations for the British forces. Only the oldest former security branch members will recall the early 60s. Rivonia, Lily's Leaf, etc. When the SB arrested Mandela and his fellow terrorists at Lily's Leaf Farm, they had been blowing up power pylons and sabotaging state infrastructure. Two of these rats, Goldreich and Walp, were detained at Marshall Square in Johannesburg. Whilst in the cells, they duped a young constable into allowing them to escape in exchange for a brand new car, costing about 1,200 and 1,500 rand in cash. At the time, the monthly wage for a constable was about 70 rand before deductions. They escaped to Lesotho disguised as priests, and from there flew on a chartered single-engined AC to Khabarone in Botswana. From Khabarone, they were due to fly to Tanzania, or Tanganyika, as I think it was still called at the time. A Central African Airways aircraft, a DC-3 Dakota, was flown to Gabs. Whilst on the ground in Gabs, it was set alight one night and burned to the ground. This was done by Phil Freeman and another. At the time, I was in Standard 8 at school. This was long before the inception of the South African Special Forces. The SA police in the early 60s had hard men to conduct operations like this. They had attended courses in France and practiced their skills with the French in the Algerian insurgency. Whilst Phil never admitted to me that he was involved in the DC-3 sabotage, we came very close to destroying the private jet of a mining conglomerate at DF Milan Airport in Cape Town in 1973-74. It had been put at the disposal of student leaders to travel between Cape Town and Johannesburg. This was due to weather and other reasons that sometimes delayed the departure of the SAA flight from Cape Town to Johannesburg, which sometimes caused the student leaders to miss their connecting flight to conferences in Europe, only arriving a day late. Phil made a fire brick to destroy the aircraft with. It had the consistency of hard fudge and was a mixture of aluminium or magnesium and sulfur. Placed on the wing, it burned at an extremely high temperature, 5,000 degrees Celsius, and would melt the aluminium wing structure like butter, passing through the wing fuel tanks and ensuring the total destruction of the aeroplane. I am sure that this was the method that was used to destroy the CAA DC-3 in Khabarone. As the way Phil talked at the time was the way one talks about something that you have already done before. Phil was a master of whatever he chose to do. He was an electronics buff and also a perfectionist on the lathe. He made a silencer in 1974 that was the quietest silencer that I had ever heard. Phil even had a kiddie's dummy or a teat over the end of the silencer to allow the projectile to exit and then to immediately close after the projectile to stop any air noise. It was around 1974 and I was getting itchy feet with the inaction at BOSS, not the fault of the organization, solely mine, as I was the square peg in a round hole. Around this time, Phil had been working with Jan Breitenbach from the SADF. They were experimenting with shaped charges at the naval shooting range in Simonstown. Red Hill comes to mind. Jan Breitenbach was with the SADF infantry base in Otwaren at the time and Phil encouraged me to join the army and go and work for Jan. I was happier rejoining the SAP as at least it was a culture that I was familiar with and I was hoping to go and fight in Rhodesia. So I rejoined the SAP in about April 1975, the security branch. However, before I could arrange to volunteer for service in Rhodesia, the South African Prime Minister John Forster withdrew the SAP from that country. Fortunately, shortly after my return to the SAP, David Prutter attacked the Israeli embassy in Fox Street, Johannesburg, and is a consequence of the SA police's poor showing during the siege 
the Sanhedrin decided that the SAP needed a SAS or GSG or SWAT type of anti-terrorist unit. This was the conception of the task force. After successfully completing STM selection, Phil gifted me with the MAT-49. It was a French version of the British Sten. Phil had made a silencer for it from a car shock absorber which screwed onto the end of the barrel. It was extremely quiet with low velocity ammunition. It now resides at the bottom of the Hartbeerstport Dam in small pieces. In Cape Town, Phil had modified a pellet gun to the proportions of a son of shotgun, only cut very short. Inside the shotgun like tube, you place very thin glass tube containing cyanide or some gas. At the end of the barrel, there was a very fine copper gauze to arrest the fragments of the glass capsule so that they do not end up in the face of the dead target. The way to use it was to place it in a folded newspaper, get up close to the target in the bus or metro, and discharge the device at his face. The whooshing noise and surprise would cause him to inhale quickly, inhaling a deadly lung full of cyanide gas, resulting in instant death. This was never used on humans, but he told me that he had tested it on a dog and it worked 100%. Phil had a direct line of communication to General Hendrik Vandenberg, the head of BOSS, as it was borne out by the following. At BOSS in Cape Town, Phil was the technical chief and fell under the jurisdiction of the regional representative. On one occasion, Phil required a substantial amount of money for some black Z-Squad operation. He required about 400 Rand, which in 1972 was a lot of money. Not even the regional representative, Henny Borta, knew what the operation was about, but he was curious and insisted that Phil provide him with the detail op of the operation before he would authorize the funds. Phil refused to provide any details of his operation, so Henny refused to authorize payment of the monies to Phil. That evening, Phil got in his ranchero and drove throughout the night to Pretoria, where he saw General Vandenberg the next morning. The regional rep was overruled by Vandenberg and Phil was back in Cape Town later that evening. Henny Butter never effed with Phil again. Killing the enemy, I expressly do not use the word murder, was probably something that came easily for Delta Victor, for Vey. He received the SA Police's highest medal for bravery for some operation in Zambia or Botswana. It was done in the commissioner's office as no mention was made about it in dispatches. He was heavily involved in the Portuguese PIDE effort in Mozambique against Frilimo and this was a no-holds-barred war by a desperate and cruel Portuguese military dictatorship. I do not criticize his or the Portuguese's actions and I would have followed a similar course of action had I been involved at the time. His other partner in the Smith affair was most probably Phil Freeman. I have thought about long and hard about the Smith murder since 1996 when the allegations of my involvement as well as that of Phil and Ferve arose in the SA media. The following is a possible set out for what transpired. Phil drives up from Cape Town and meets Ferve at a motel on the East Rand where a room is booked in a false name. He would have used his subsidized vehicle with false plates. This way, there would be no air ticket records and Phil would have disconnected the speedometer on his boss subsidized vehicle so as to not have to explain excessive mileage. Phil travels overnight, arriving mid-morning and sleeps for most of the day. Ferve arrives late afternoon and they go over the final planning for the mission in the motel room, consuming takeaway food Ferve supplied. Ferve has a stolen car that they use for the mission and he provides the weapons. There would be no drinking before the ops. After completion of the mission, they return to the motel to shower and get rid of their bloodstained clothing. Both have one celebratory dope of whiskey and then Ferve drives the car to a remote area adjoining a black township on the West Rand where he torches the vehicle. 
Phil then drops him off at his official vehicle safely parked somewhere in Springs or environs. Ferve goes back home to Pretoria and drives back to Cape Town, arriving in the early hours and phoning in sick to take the day off to rest. Phil would not have left the contaminated clothing in the stolen vehicle they set alight, just in case it did not burn out properly. He would have taken it with him and stopped somewhere in the middle of the desolate Karoo. He would have completely burnt it out with petrol, then stirred the ashes and burnt it again. It was only about 10 years after the Smith murders, while I was stationed in Oshakati with the SADF, that an old friend from my SB days in Cape Town, now a major with the SB in Oshakati, mentioned to me that he had been approached by the investigating team in the Smith murders in 1977 about my possible involvement in the murders. They apparently thought I might have done it if Robert Smith, who was a real ladies' man, had been having an affair with Ida whilst she worked for him. They wanted to clandestinely search my apartment in Silverton where Ida and I were living in 1977-1978. I am unaware if they did in fact do so. Phil Freeman was a fierce anti-communist and a true patriot of South Africa and Western values. He was neither a criminal nor a thug. I personally cannot see him becoming involved in something like this just for the sake of protecting corrupt members of the National Party who might have been transferring government monies to offshore accounts for their personal enrichment. He was vehemently opposed to both the Broder Bonders and the Freemasons, who seemed to have a 50-50 following in the SA police or boss at the time. The whole matter changes radically, however, if he were told that Smith was working for the Soviet Union. Then, he would not have had any qualms in killing them both. Many earlier versions allege that there were four individuals involved. Dries Ferve, Phil Freeman, myself, and another founder member of the police special task force. However, only two persons were required for this operation. Two would be the safe number in the event of unforeseen complications, which could possibly overwhelm a lone operator. Additional unneeded members would only serve to complicate matters and potentially compromise the security of this event. Later allegations by XNI and SAP clowns like Ty Menar, Pony van der Furen, Fail Orstazen and others of cleaner squads sanitizing the scene after the event and Smith's briefcase being seen in Ferve's safe are utter rubbish. Crooks like Menar were solely motivated by greed and self-enrichment. I also discount the view that the murders were carried out by a foreign hit squad. History is littered with examples of instances where somebody employed another to kill someone. And after the killing, the murderer kept returning for more silence money before eventually spilling the beans. There was all the more reason for the hired killers to come out and own up to the story after the National Party transferred power to the ANC in 1994. Yet, all that has been heard is a deathly silence. In around 1977-78, Phil and his wife emigrated from South Africa to Brittany in France. They returned to South Africa sometime in the mid-1980s. I was in the SADF in Southwest Africa at the time and only remade contact with him in the early 1990s. I last saw Phil in Cape Town in 1992-93 when I was working for the military in Pretoria. My work took me to Cape Town over a weekend from time to time and I would invariably enjoy a Sunday lunch and visit with Phil and his charming wife before flying back to Johannesburg. Phil never referred to this matter during the course of our conversations. The protocols in the intelligence services are never to raise sensitive subjects like these unless they were raised by the operator. In conclusion, I am, sadly, of the opinion that the Smith murders will never be solved. This is a pity for their children who would like some closure on the matter and my heart goes out to them. The reasons that I believe this are twofold. It was the perfect murder executed by professionals and the perpetrators are all dead. 
Our main purpose for compiling this narrative is simply to offer a possible explanation of how this criminal event could have occurred. I believe that the persons mentioned above were all in probability the perpetrators of the murders and by association with them I include myself. The fourth member has been unfairly and wrongly dragged along due to his association or friendship with me exactly as I was due to my association or friendship with Fervey and Freeman. I am quite frank when I state unequivocally that had I been involved, I would now admit to it and face the appropriate sanction. As an atheist, my imminent mortality does not bother me in the least. It is rather more an issue of what is right. Hopefully, somebody reading this, and who had some knowledge of the matter will, on reading this, decide to break the logjam and tell what they know. Possibly a police investigating officer at the murder scene, or some other bureaucrat within the civil service who was privy to this matter? I believe that you owe it to yourself, South Africa and the Smith children. That brings us to the end of Roy Allen's account of the tragedy that befell the Smith family. Decades have since passed since the Smith murders. At the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings, the couple's death was formally recognized as a politically motivated murder. To this day, the murders remain unsolved. If you were listening to this episode and happen to have information that could help investigators, please contact SAPS's toll-free crime stop number at 08600 10111. This brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you for listening.